Hello. Hello. How are you, Rodney? We're doing great. How are you, big guy? Great to have you on, everyone. This is Rodney Harrison, current current analyst, former Patriot, champion, fucking boss. I like Rodney Harrison. How you doing tonight? Man, I'm doing great, man. What's what's going on with you guys? Not much. Just just talking some NFL action right now. Hopefully you'll uh, hop in on it. Should Ben That's should good. Ben Roethlisberger have played last night? Can we start with that? Could you just repeat that, buddy? Should Ben Roethlisberger have even start, not even start, played at all last night? Well, you know what? It's it's kind of that's a tough situation because as a head coach, you try to trust your quarterback, the most important player on your team, and he's a veteran quarterback, so you figured he would tell you if he's okay. But I think it was really ultimately up to Mike Tomlin to kind of gauge. The question is, do you want a 70% Ben Roethlisberger or do you want 100% Charlie Ward or a backup quarterback? That's the question. In, in, my, in, in my case, I'm looking at it as Ben Roethlisberger, the strength of his game is moving around, getting outside that pocket and making those plays down the field. He was not able to do that. So in, in that situation, I feel like you rest Ben Roethlisberger and you put in your backup quarterback. I, I agree with that. And can we also, just to shut my friend John up over here, is he an elite quarterback in the NFL? Ben? Ben is a league quarterback because he's got championships, multiple championships. It's not the prototypical type like Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady or Drew Brees where he's dropping back and he's going to throw the ball 35, 40 times and look like, you know, the picture-perfect quarterback. But he has his own style. But the one most important thing is he's very productive and he is an elite quarterback because he's got those rings. Thank you. All right, Rodney, uh, John's here with you. I want to get started off with, with your career a little bit. Uh, you were drafted by the Chargers in 94. What is the feeling like to see your name up on that board? Man, you know what? It was probably a little more exciting for me because I left school. I came out as a junior, and I came out of a really small school. So they said they had me kind of pinned in being a third rounder to a seventh rounder, possibly a free agent. And, you know, that was very nerve-wracking because once I entered into the draft, it was either get drafted or go back and finish up school. But, man, it, it felt great. It felt awesome just to be able to celebrate that with my family and eventually getting that check so I can um, help my mom out. Now, you came from a smaller school in uh, western Illinois. What, it was the, what was the jump like to go from that to the big boys of the NFL? Well, you know what? Um, it, was, it was, you know what? It was difficult in terms of, like, my size because I was a real small safety. I was only about 175 pounds uh, as a, a junior in college. And to make that jump from – you know, Western Illinois, Division One AA college to, to the NFL, that's a huge jump. But I was very fortunate because I played special teams my rookie year, and it gave me a time to kind of develop, work on my body, and really learn the game from a mental standpoint. And once you learn the game from a mental standpoint, and that's the problem with young players nowadays. They're physically gifted, they're big, they're strong, they're fast, but they don't know the game. And once you know the game and you can start reading stuff, and, and really relying on your instincts, that's when you can have a long, productive career. All right, uh, Rodney, my question to you now is you're, you're playing that you had an awesome career, but now you're, you're analyzing games. I, being a Jet fan, I would like to know what you think about what happened with San Antonio Holmes this, this past weekend. I'm not, me personally, I'm not upset when guys dance, whatever you want to dance, dance. I'm upset that you dance I'll after. I'll put it like this. I'll put it like this. It's a time and place for everything, and that's what you tell your kids. You say it's a time and place, and it's a time to be a professional. It's time to, you know, understand that you're getting your butt absolutely kicked. You're at, you, you dropped a couple balls, fumbles, they return it for touchdowns. It's just not a place for that. It wasn't a time or a situation for that. And I think sometimes guys get caught up so much in the emotion of the game, they don't think before they start doing things. And I think that's what happened with San Antonio. He's a tremendous player. Obviously, he has a lot of growing to do like, like we all do. But, you know, I wouldn't judge him based off of that one game. I think he's a tremendously hardworking young man. I think he's going to be a great wide receiver for, for many years. My my follow up question to that would be when is the learning curve over? When is the uh he is gonna be a tremendous young I mean, he's been in the league already ho- however so many years, he's won a ring already. When is that we whole all make mistakes, man, but the, people don't you know, it's always in life you're always evolving, you're always learning and you just hope to become a better person, a better player than you were the day before. And I think it's you know, it doesn't matter if you're an eighth year player in the league, fifteenth year player in the league. You're always learning. I think from a from a standpoint of leadership, that's the thing that I say to him. The way you lead is by an example. 
coming in every day, working hard, being focused, not attracting attention, negative attention to yourself and to your team. I think that's all part of leadership. And when you're a young player, you grow and you learn how to become a leader. Some people have it naturally in them, but he's in a position where he has to be a leader because he's one of the top elite players on that team. So I just think with time, he'll eventually get it figured out. Hi, uh, we have Rodney Harrison on Flagrant Foul Radio. Rodney, Frank here. I want to get your take on the thing with Ndamukong Sue from last week, how you feel he's going to react, if you feel he's mature enough to, to keep his head clean. Also with James Harrison, because you were a tough player. You were a hard-hitting player. You know, you didn't you didn't take a, you know, you weren't soft on the field by any stretch of the no, imagination. No, but, you know, it's, but, but, you know, it's not about them being soft or me being soft or being tough. We're tough, and we know that. Sue is tough, one of the toughest uh, players that I've seen play, as well as James Harrison. And I was the same way, and we didn't take anybody's crap, but at the same time, we have to be smarter when we're out on the field. I learned after I got suspended, you know, all of those hits and stuff like that, you have to play within the, the whistle and with it in between the lines. And you can't get suspended and you hurt your team. You know, James Harris is an integral part of that team. And Dominic is the best player on that Detroit defense. And when he wasn't there for Minnesota um, against the um, Saints, they weren't able to put pressure on the quarterback and things like that. So you have to understand that the game is not just about you. It's about your team. It's not one guy that makes the team. It's 53 guys united that makes the team. So I think these guys will learn from the situation that happened to them. You know, a lot of times when you take something away from a person that really loves something, it takes that in order for them to learn and move forward. I think these guys won't go back and make those same mistakes. Do you think you could play in today's NFL? Not necessarily the speed and strength of these guys, but the fact of the secondary is not a, not allowed to hit as hard as they once were. It seems uh, just just all the changes that have made it in favor of being on the offensive side of the ball. Well, I mean that's that's all part of it. Yes, yes, I could play, and I would have to play smarter. But yes, I could play, and at times it would be frustrating as a defensive player because. Sometimes they get flat-out ridiculous as far as, you know, the league and, and some of the calls that they make. But they're always erring on the side of caution because I'm going to tell you, point blank, the league does not want players to come back 10, 15, 20 years from now and sue them. It's going to happen. Guys going to get all types of Lou Gehrig's, uh, Lou Gehrig's and ALS and all this other stuff concussions, memory loss, and they're going to come back and they're going to have multi-million dollar lawsuits against the National Football League. So the league is trying to do everything they possibly can at this point to protect themselves from those possible lawsuits and protect players' health right now. Rodney, you spend week after week after week sitting next to or across from Tony Dungy. Have you learned more about defense being next to him, and have you by being next to him, is there anything that makes you want to get into the coaching profession? First of all, the, the person that I sat next to that I learned the most from is Bill Belichick. And no disrespect to Tony Dungy, but being around Bill 10, 12 hours a day, learning, learning situational football, learning the game and how to look at things from a different perspective, from a team perspective, that taught me a lot because he's a fabulous, uh, fabulous coach. And, a, and really a, a, a good man and a, a funny person to be around. Tony Dungy is as real as advertised. His spiritual walk, um, what he stands for, and he's very smart, and he doesn't take any crap. Let me tell you that because he'll criticize, he'll critique just like anyone else. But being around Tony, he's shown me some, some different things, and I've learned a lot from Tony as far as – because, you, you know, you spend so many hours watching tape and – and breaking down things with a person, you can't do anything but learn from him, and he's been tremendous in that respect. As far as coaching, yes, I've had interest in coaching, but at this point I have um, I have three kids, seven years and under, and right now my focus is on raise, being able to raise my kids and spend time with them and coach them and not coach a bunch of grown men that might not listen to me. When you were in San Diego, you played for a lot of different head coaches in a short span of time. Bobby Ross, Kevin Gilbride, June Jones, Mike Riley, Marty Schottenheimer. Yep. Did any of those guys compare to Bill Belichick on or off the field? Um, um, I would say Marty in the sense of what he demands, what he demands as far as his um, players. He he demands, you know, he wants you to he wants you to be really good. He wants you to be great, and he'll push you and he'll jump on you. Um, in terms of that, but Bill Belichick, he was the ultimate coach for me because I've learned more more in football in six years than I did, you know, 
in my previous nine years because it was just a matter of breaking things down, showing me how to look at it, Rodney. You don't have to be um, the fastest, the strongest, the most physical, but you could be the smartest and still be just as a productive player. So that's why I started really learning things when I went to um, – I've learned a lot, trust me, in San Diego. But when I learned to build Belichick, his system and his way, trust me, it took me to the next level. Now, you were the first person in NFL history with 30 interceptions and 30 sacks. Since then, Ray Lewis has joined you in that category. What does that mean to you, to be to be uh, notarized as, as one of those guys? You know what, because everyone you know, everyone pays attention to uh, it's the reputation that I had and saying that I'm, I was a dirty player. I wasn't a dirty player. I was a very, I was a very physical, hard-nosed player, but, it wasn't, but I wasn't a dirty player. I think that right there shows people. They say... They put me in one category. You know, he can't, he can't um, cover. Well, I can cover and I can hit. And that's the thing. I wanted, That, to me, shows that I'm a complete football player because I'll hit you, I'll sack you, I'll make interceptions, and I felt like I did it all as a player. And it really, you know, a lot of people take away from what I did or accomplished on the field because of other things that went on with me. Would you rather have that big pick or, or drill a quarterback for a sack? Um, I'd rather knock somebody out, quite honestly. That's just the way I've been. That's my mentality, and that's the way I've been trained. Rodney, uh, my question for you is, was there anyone that ever lined up on the other side of the field where when you just saw them on the field, you would lick your chops and be like, I just want to hit this guy? Um, you know, for, uh, I, you know I'm, I'm going to flip it on the other side. It was only two players, two players when I first started football that I actually looked at and I had fear in my eyes. Okay, I'll switch it around. The one person was Jerry Rice, guarding Jerry Rice. It was a blitz, and our nickelback blitz, and I was one-on-one with Jerry Rice, and he did some route in San Diego and caught a touchdown in front of me, and I said, wow, I did not know this guy was so fast, had great hands, and run such a good route. The other player was Barry, um, um, Barry Sanders that I had a chance to tackle on the one-yard line. He pulled me over, I think, on a Monday night football game, so... Um, those are two guys that I had the most fear when I initially started playing. In 2005, you had that knee injury where you tore your ACL, MCL, PCL. Did you ever think that that was the end, or did you know you were going to come back from that? You know what? In, in that situation, you never know what may happen. I just, I really just wanted to start walking again, man. And I tell you, when I saw my knee after they did surgery, it was big as a softball. And I, and I just prayed. And I said, God, you know, let your will be done. Wherever you want to take me, I'm going to try to trust you, and I'm going to believe in you, man. And 11 months later, I was back on that football field. man. I tell you, man, when you put your faith in the Lord, man, and if you really trust in him, regardless if, if you want to do something, if, if, it's, if it's his will for you to do it, it's going to be done, regardless of what people say, because everybody said I was done, but he had a different plan. All right, uh, Rodney, I have a quick question. What's your favorite accomplishment in, in your NFL career? What's the one thing that you could say – I did that, and you're most proud of. You know what? The, probably the thing that I was most proud of is when I joined the New England Patriots, you know, not any tackles, Super Bowls, interceptions, and all this other stuff, but when I joined the New England Patriots and within the first, you know, month of me being there, they named me captain. That really meant a lot to me. That really shows that they respected uh, my hard work, my commitment to team, my unselfishness, and everything that I stood for. That was the thing that really just, man, really just made me feel good because when you, you know, you can't go in there and fool people. You know, they understand how hard you work, your approach, your priorities. And if you can, you know, gain the respect of 52, you know, uh, players in that locker room as well as the coaches and trainers and stuff like that, man, that that really is probably the biggest accomplishment I've had. All right, um, I, we got a few more minutes. I would just like to throw out maybe a couple of names at you. And if you could just – the first well, thing okay. – the first thing that pops into your head, just yep. hearing these names, if uh, Aaron Rodgers, start with him. Best in the business, beast. Um, make all the throws, phenomenal. Uh, just amazed when I when I sit back and I watch him play each and every Sunday. Okay, how about Tim Tebow? Um, football player, a straight football player. I, my wife loved him in college. I loved him in college. Didn't know that. He would be able to drop back and throw the ball, but he's a football player. He's a player where you could put a tight end, running back, fullback, and he'll be productive at all of them. Would you want him on your team? 
Oh, of course. I would love for what he stands for off the field, his hard work, his leadership, his commitment. I would love to have Tim Tebow on my team any day. I'll find room for him anywhere. How about Ray Lewis? Um, Ray Lewis is um, he's um, one of the greatest football players I've ever laid eyes on, and and I would say. I have three, probably my three top football players, three or four top football players, and he's definitely one of them. I love Ray Lewis, love him, love him, love him. He played the game the way, plays the game the way it's supposed to be played. Mad respect for Ray. One last name, David Tyree. David Tyree, um, just a great catch, phenomenal catch, Super Bowl winner, um, well deserved. He held on to it. Um, it it is what it is, buddy. You do know. You, does that still haunt you? Like once in a while, do you think about that? And like you, son not of at a... all, man. You know, not at all. You know, um, it's 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 one thing to have it done to you repeatedly, but when you look at the tape and see how it happens, some things in life are just meant to be. You know, what I'm saying you can't explain it. You can't you can't understand it. Some things just happen. You know what I'm saying, brother? And it ain't nothing that it's nothing that you know I could have done. Even more, you know, I, I, 225 pounds, ripping the ball out, bench press over 400 pounds, and it's nothing else more I could have done. And it haunted me initially because I'm a, I'm a winner, I'm a hard worker, um, I, I, I never wanted to disappoint my teammates. It haunted me initially, but when I really sat back and thought of, about it, I did everything within my power to try to knock that ball loose, and it just it wasn't meant to be. Speaking of those playoffs and all the playoffs you had with the Patriots, your seven interceptions in the, in the playoffs are a Patriots record. How did you step up your game when, when it came postseason? Brother, it's mental. It's mental. It's studying. It's watching film. Praise God. Um, put me in the right situation where, you know, I can make plays. But I've worked hard, man. i worked hard. There's no doubt. I, I, I studied extra film, studying Peyton Manning and Ben Roethlisberger and going against all those, you know, even Jacksonville when I picked David Gerard off. Um, being, being very mentally uh, prepared, and that's the thing. You know, a lot of these players, they lift weights, they work out, they're flexible, they're fast, but they don't have the instincts because they haven't studied and prepared themselves. And that, that's what gives, gives you an extra step, not just lifting weights and running and working on 40-yard dashes, but it's the mental aspect. Rodney, we want to say thank you very much for coming on. Uh, this is Matt. I'm the one who reached out to you on Twitter, and I just want to say like thanks for being a real guy you know like it's pretty cool of you to to give us a chance and we just want to say thank you for that you know brother thanks for reaching out anytime you you need me you know at least well maybe once a month but you know it's all good man i just want to let you know that because you told me you was like i was like i don't know you and you was like look man I, I just you know i need you to come on and you know young brother's trying to do something i'm like man i'm all for it man anything positive i'm for thank Rodney, you very thank much, you man. so much have man. a happy holiday Take care, brother. God bless. You too. You too, man. All right, Rodney Harrison. Fucking boss. Chill, dude. Cool, yeah, cool. And honest, man. Yeah, Real and honest. honest guy, like, just gave some young, like, how many people could say they fucking spoke to Rodney Harrison? Not many, bitch. Not we young did. guys. We did, we but did. That's all that matters. It's pretty fucking awesome.